So this lecture is on seizure disorders. So what drugs we can use for people that have seizures. And over here is a diagram of the stages of seizures. Let me pull up a bigger diagram so that we can see this better. So we have four different stages. The first stage is called the aura stage. And this is where if you're going through a seizure, Typically, before a seizure, you start to feel dizzy or feel numb or have weird emotions going through or, or confused. Uh, some people will say that they have this weird taste in their mouth. Some people will say that they are very sensitive to light all of a sudden. So this is like an aura stage that typically happens before you go into the seizure stage. There's also a tonic stage. And this is where your body just becomes stiff. It becomes rigid. And this is where, you know, you could pass urine. Your back usually arcs. We have the clonic stage, and this is the one that you see in the movies. This is the one where there are actually jerky movements happening, where the body is shaking. And then once the seizure is done, usually the body goes to this stage, which is called the postictal stage. And this is where now you're exhausted. You feel tired because you had this huge workout, this huge jerky movement thing happening that just tired you out completely. So there are medications such as anticonvulsants that prevent seizures. So epilepsy, when you think of epilepsy, you think of seizures and know that there, there are medications used, obviously, to treat epilepsy and they're called anticonvulsants. That's the category of those medications. Now, there are, these medications can also be used for um, people who have neurologic pain, which we'll look at, so facial pain, or even people who have some mental disorders, they could also use anticonvulsant medication. So this medication is not necessarily always for seizures. It could also be used for people who have facial pain or for some mental disorders, which we'll look at. So when someone has epilepsy, what's happening is in their brain, they're getting some electrical activity, some abnormal electrical activity, and that's what causes a seizure. So there are uh, three different types of seizures or classifications of seizures. There's the generalized seizure, partial seizure, and the miscellaneous or the unknown uh, cause of seizure. So let's look at the generalized one. So generalized seizure, when you look at this picture over here, what this means is that the seizure is happening all over the brain. It's generalized. Whereas partial seizure is when it's um, happening in a, in a section of the brain. And sometimes we have an unknown onset where we don't know where the seizure is, um, where the seizure has been started. Okay, so generalized means it's all over the brain. Partial, or some people say call it focal, is when it's just one section of the brain. And then many times we have seizures where we don't know where what causes it, and we don't know where it started either. And that is known as unknown onset. So let's look at generalized seizure, and this is where it's happening all over the brain. The electrical impulses or signals are messed up all over the brain. You could have two types, or there are two types of generalized seizure. There's the tonic-clonic, and there's the absent seizure. So tonic-clonic seizure is when you lose consciousness. Actually, with both of them, absent seizure and tonic-clonic, you lose consciousness. Okay, and so loss of consciousness, you can see that is written in both sections. So we don't know when we go through this, if we ever experience this, we would not know, we would not be aware of our surroundings because we have lost consciousness. There is an aura with the tonic clonic. So that means you kind of know that is happening because you'll start to feel weird. It happens. And you have loss of jerky movements happening with the tonic clonic especially in the clonic phase, right? The jerky movements happens in the clonic phase. In the absence seizure, you're just, you know, reading and all of a sudden you just have this blank stare where um, you just stop moving. And here we have no aura, aura, so you don't feel confused before this happens. It's just a quick onset. The recovery here is quick. As soon as you recover from this, you can go back to your normal move or normal routine. Whereas with the tonic clonic, after you recover from this, it's a slow recovery. It takes you a while. You feel exhausted. You feel tired. Your limbs feel really weak after this uh, tonic clonic seizure. But with the absence seizure, you can go right back and do your normal routine and continue on with your day. This over here is called status epilepticus and this is basically when you have a seizure when you have abnormal electrical impulses in your brain for more than 30 minutes so you're seizing for 30 minutes or more 
that is an emergency situation, then you know we need to be seen by a doctor, a SAP after the seizure. And the type of medication that we usually, um, or if clients have the seizure, the type of medications they're usually on is known as diazepam or Valium. So we looked at generalized seizure where it's happening all over the brain, right? The impulses, the electrical impulses are happening all over the brain. Now we're gonna look at partial and with partial seizures happening at a focal or a section of the brain. Okay, starts in one part of the brain. The difference in partial is that there's two types, there's simple partial and complex partial. In the simple partial, you're conscious, but in the complex partial, you're not conscious. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, show you, I don't, okay, so in the complex partial, you're not, you're not conscious. So that's the main difference between the two. Now, when you take drugs to help with the seizures, as we know, all drugs have adverse effects, and the common adverse effects we see with anticonvulsants is that your central nervous system just depresses, so your brain just kind of slows down. Um, you could become tired, you could have impaired learning or, and thinking skills, or the opposite could happen, Where and this is commonly seen in children, where they become hyperactive, they, social, um, they have aggression even, um, behavior modification, their behavior changes, so sometimes you could get hyperactivity and then gastrointestinal distress, so nausea, vomiting, that sort of stuff can happen. Rashes are also a possibility with anticonvulsants. If you're pregnant and you're taking this medication, it could affect the growth of the baby. And when you get older or when someone gets older who's on this anticonvulsant medication, the doctor may say to withdraw or to slowly taper off that medication. And what's important is that it's done slowly, not abruptly. If you take out that medication from right away, if you stop taking that medication right away, you, you will start seizing again. So it's important to gradually withdraw from that medication. So slowly taper off. So Valproate is a very common medication that is used to treat um, seizures. And of course, there's always side effects such as um, in digestion, nausea, vomiting, <clears throat> people who get really tired and drowsy with this medication. Mm -hmm. And this is really important. So valproate affects a section of the body and that is the liver. So the liver can become toxic and that's what hepatotoxicity means, that the liver is now toxic. So hepa comes from the word liver, toxic. So when the liver becomes toxic, and liver is really important, right? The liver helps filter out all the bad stuff in our body. It filters everything from our blood. And so we need our liver. We can't afford for the liver to get toxic. So this is a very uh, important fact. The way I remember it is the L in the valproate means that it uh, it's, uh, can make the liver toxic. So other medications that people do use um, for, and for seizures is this one over here. This is called Lamotrigine. And Lamotrigine is usually used for elderly clients. It's also used for those that have just been diagnosed with epilepsy. Children tolerate really well with this medication. And this medication, as I said, yes, usually it is used for seizures, but sometimes it's also used for non-seizure related purposes like depression. So it helps improve depression. Carmab. Sorry. So this slide over here is talking about carmazepine, and carmazepine uh, is a very important medication to know because it's usually used for depressing, antidepressants, usually used for depression. But know that sometimes the this medication that's used for depression can also help with seizures as well. So this medication over here is used as an anticonvulsant, which means it helps with seizure. It's also used as an antidepressant. So carbamazepine has uh, several side effects, as we see over here. It also has GI effects, so it can cause nausea and vomiting. And it also causes rashes as well. 
what we're most interested in are the oral effects of carbamazepine. And so the oral effects are that you could have a dry mouth, so xerostomia. You could also have glossitis, and glossitis is when your tongue becomes red and inflamed. What's interesting to note is that if you were to take this medication, so children, they usually take uh, carba carbamazepine, and they, it's a chewable medication. And so when they take this chewable medication, the sugar content is extremely high. So it's important to teach them uh, how to brush and how, uh, properly because they take this medication four times a day. Usually it's taken four times a day. So they're exposed to sugar many times. So it's important that they come regularly for a cleaning and that we educate them on the importance of keeping their mouth clean. Okay, this is a huge, um, or it's a very, very important medication for us to know because it has a significant dental um, component to it. So last time, and we learned about this medication called nifedipine. And we said that nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, so it helps with the heart, helps with high blood pressure. Nifedipine causes gingival enlargement. So that's one medication that we know that causes gingival enlargement. Here is another, phenytoin. Phenytoin causes in gingival enlargement too. Phenytoin is used for seizures. So this is another medication that people may be on for seizures. It's not the first medication. It's not the drug of first choice um, because there's many side effects, which we'll look at. Usually they use other medications for seizures, such as Valparate. But phenytoin is a medication that could be prescribed to our clients. And the biggest side effect is the gingival enlargement. So here we see significant gingival enlargement that is taken when you take phenytoin. I want you guys to know that usually when you get enlargement, it starts with the maxillary anterior. Okay, so the gums usually get inflamed in the maxillary anterior before it gets inflamed elsewhere. We don't know why. We don't know why it's happening. But know that when it, if someone takes phenytoin, you do get gingival enlargement. We don't know why, but we can manage it. So we could, you know, tell them to go to a doctor and see if they could try a different anti-epileptic drug. We could, you know, tell them to be diligent with their oral hygiene because the more diligent you are with your oral hygiene, the inflammation or the gingival enlargement won't be as bad. There's this surgery that you'll learn about in perio that's called gingivectomy, and what they do is they actually remove this excess scum. But what they're saying is that wait at least 18 months before you take before you do the gingivectomy, before you get this removed. And the reason why is because let's say you stop this medication, let's say you stop taking phenytoin. After one year, you will notice that the gums usually um reduce in size so it won't be this enlarged so that's why they're saying wait 18 months because maybe after 18 months your gums will be back to normal so you don't have to go through this invasive surgery so wait 18 months before doing gingivectomy you can see over here that there's many other drugs that can be taken for um, seizures now what happens when you have a client who's seizing in your chair well Typically what we say is we want to move the patient to the floor if possible. Now sometimes I know in a dental clinic that's not possible, so let them stay in their chair, but we want to recline or put the chair in, a, um, in the down position, in the supine position. We want to tilt the client's head to one side, so turn them around to one side. And the reason why is because we want to prevent aspiration, so prevent choking, and also they breathe better when they're turned to one side. And if there are any objects in the patient's mouth, we're gonna take them out, okay? Because the last thing we wanna do is cause trauma to their teeth. So remove all objects, if you can, from the person's mouth. Last point over here is that, as we know, there are medications. So these medications over here are used for seizures, but they could also be used for non-seizure uses. So for example, carbamazepine. This is used to treat trigeminal neuralgia. So look at this over here. Some people can have severe pain when they're just opening their mouth and brushing their teeth, and it causes severe pain. That's what's trigeminal neuralgia, because their nerves over here try for three, so one, two, three. These nerves are inflamed and it's causing severe pain. So this medication could be used to help treat that pain. So this medication is used for seizures. It can also be used to treat facial pain. Um, valproic acid is also used for headaches. So not necessarily for seizures, but also for headaches. 
And then there are some medications like these, these four that are listed over here that, again, are used for seizures, but they could also be used to treat certain mental disorders such as depression, for example.